Welcome to For the Record, I'm Suzanne O'Halloran. After 24 years at Fidelity Investments, Bob Reynolds left to become CEO of Putnam. His timing couldn't have been worse as the global economy went into freefall. I sat down with Reynolds here at the company's Boston yeah. headquarters and we talked about the challenges he's facing, rebranding and rebuilding this firm. It was uh, challenging, but I think it played itself out later on in the year. And uh, it was actually, when you join a, a company and you know you have to make changes, uh, it's actually an ideal ch time. In fact, when I first joined Putnam, I said, it'd be nice if this market was flat or down because it would give us a chance to retool and put together the things we needed to do to compete. Uh, I think the fourth quarter was a little more than I wished for, but it really, uh, I think, allowed us an opportunity to really restructure, hire new people, and get to a place where we can compete against anyone. You have said that you want to make Putnam right. one of the top five funds. I've talked to a lot of people. They think that is going to be extremely difficult. What do you say to those skeptics? This is going to be easy. How so? How are well, you going to do it? Well, I mean, Putnam is a pure play on money management. All we do are invest other people's money. And to become one of the top players, uh, we have to perform. So it's performing in existing products, and that means having the right people, the right incentives, the right resources supporting them which we're doing. It means being very uh, aggressive when it comes to developing new products, very much of an innovator, which we're, tr we're doing. And I think if we continue down this path, especially with the performance, with the innovation, with getting in the 401k business, uh, I think uh, us attaining that is not going to be that difficult. If you look at your outflow numbers, uh, your fund flow numbers. Those are still showing out of your longer term funds that you are seeing outflows. That's a sure. signal that there are still some problems there. What are you doing to stop that? Yeah, I, I think one of the uh, initial things when I got here, the so-called flagship funds, the older funds, had significant outflows. And in order to turn an entity around like Putnam, you have to fix the leaky bucket, so to speak. So that's when we went about looking to process people, et cetera, and all that's been changed. And the performance of all those funds has changed dramatically, and right now our um, redemptions are half the industry. So that tells you that part's working. What hasn't happened yet, and I, I'd, say, I'd say it's a marketplace issue as well as we have some past legacy, no question about it, but there haven't been flows into equities this year. And I think once you see that, I think you'll see the Putnam funds that have had major turnarounds uh, get their fair share. What do you think we will see that turnaround? What are you seeing from your clients? There have been positive flows year to date in fixed income, so our fixed income funds are doing well. Uh, as we talked, equity funds have had outflows. Our new funds, a lot of our new funds have had positive inflows every day. All year, every day, you pick up the paper or turn on TV, you hear that the S&P just went into positive territory, it dropped back to negative, went to positive, negative. What has been missed is the positive returns that active managers have provided to investors this year, both on the equity side and fixed income. Our bond funds uh, are over 20% return year to date. So I, I think, and I, I'm talking to Putnam now, but I think across the board, active management has added significant value. It's truly been, on the equity side, a stock picker's market. And because of the unbelievable bond spreads due to a technical problem in the market, lack of liquidity, uh, you're seeing great returns from fixed income. And when people see that at mid-year, they're going to say, what am I doing earning less than 1%? Your absolute return funds, you've been very vocal about how those are the next great product, right. so to speak. How are you selling those to Joe Main Street? Describe them. What are they? Yeah, I, I think absolute return is a concept uh, high net worth individuals and institutions have known for many, many years. And it's a, re, it's, it's a strategy to generate positive returns no matter what asset category. And usually, 
you have a sp specific target, but what has happened over the past few years, especially in the hedge fund space, uh, the greater return a person got, the more money the money manager made. So that changed behavior a little bit. So what we have done at Putnam is taken the absolute return type uh, or the absolute return strategy, which we've used on the institutional side of the market for the last decade, and brought it to the retail space by, you know, dealing with disclosure, liquidity, uh, performance pricing. In other words, all these funds have performance fees, and bringing absolute returns to Main Street, where these funds are set up where you can do T bills plus 700, T bills plus 500. T bills plus 300 or T bills plus one, and again, this way the the investor or the advisor can choose what type of return they want, what type of risk they want to take. We're the first ones to bring out a family of them and to manage to a specific return target, and that does make them unique. And again, we're drawn apart upon a decade of experience on the institutional side to manage these funds. And I think what's uh, been misunderstood about so-called absolute return, I go back to the so-called hedge fund space where people use leverage, they shorted stocks, they did a lot of things to generate as high a return as possible because that was in the incentive part of the, the agreement. The way we've set these funds up from a pricing standpoint I think is very, very important. For us to get our standard fee and our regular mutual fund fees, we have to just hit the return target. And if it's a 500 fund, it's T-bills plus 500, we hit that, we get our standard fee. Now we have put performance fees in all these funds, so if we're less than that, our fee goes down. For more than that, it goes up, but it is a uh, matrix type fee which can go up as much as it goes down so it puts us uh, it puts us on the same side of the table as the investor and if you look over time again going back to people who have used these funds successfully for years high net worth individuals and institutions they have put 25 to 50 percent of their portfolios in these type of investments and they, they, they're diversification tools, but they also provide you a consistent rate of return over time, which is what any investor wants. You have been in the 401k business pretty much since its inception. What we've seen over the past year is companies cutting back on their 401k plans. What is your view on that? Is that dangerous for long-term retirement folks? Well, I, I think if you go back to 401k and they started in the early 80s, the initial uh, reason for a 401k was a supplemental plan to a defined benefit plan. But what's happened over time is 401k has replaced the defined benefit as the main retirement vehicle, and especially since the year 2000 when most companies got out of the defined benefit, 401k is your retirement. So it's America's retirement vehicle. So that is a huge change. We've seen people's net worth decline dramatically in the past year, especially for those folks approaching retirement. Uh, how do you convince people to invest at all in the stock market considering the events of the past 12 months? The market really hasn't changed in, for decades and uh, the, the greatest risk people will say is this time it's different. And the most interesting thing to me about the stock market is the longer your time horizon the more predictable it is. So I can't tell you what the market's doing tomorrow, but 10 years from now, I'll tell you it's going to be up. <laughs> so I, I think that's what people should focus in on. The real uh, key factor for any investor is their time horizon. And the shorter it is, probably the more conservative they should be invested. When we looked at some of Putnam and their investments, GE is one of those investments. That company has been under a lot of stress because of their exposure to the financial markets. Uh, is this an opportunity to buy a blue chip company like GE? Sure. I, I, th I think GE is one of the most well-run companies in the United States. They have a great CEO. Uh, I think it's been judged by the marketplace as a financial stock. And I'm not so sure that is the right judgment or valuation for that company. So we, we would like a company like GE. And we love their leadership. As many financial firms cut workers, 
Bob Reynolds has been hiring, luring top talent from his biggest rivals. It's hard to pinpoint one, but I, I do think uh, one of the most recent ones we've done uh, will end up having as great an impact as any, and that's hiring Walter Donovan to be Chief Investment Officer of Putnam. So I, I, I think if over time uh, that'll be the most significant hire because what he brings is experience in equities, fixed income, money market, high yield, U.S., non-U.S., trading, research, portfolio management, and uh, I think we got the best in the country. You've hired a few high-profile folks from Fidelity. How'd you get them to join you? Um, it's interesting. We, we have hired people that have Fidelity on their resume. Uh, the, the direct from Fidelity is a much smaller number. But I think it's the same story to anyone. I mean, we're trying to get very successful people to come here. And to do that, we have to make it an attractive proposition. And how we do that is we have a great ownership. Uh, the Power Group, Power Financial out of Montreal, are deep-pocketed long-term investors, so they're behind Putnam. Uh, we have ownership in the company. The company is 10 percent owned by its employees, so they pr can participate in the success of the company. Then, uh, you, you know, having been part of uh, some major growth stories in the financial services field, I think the appeal to people is this is a chance to do something you'll never have a chance to do again in your working life. And that's really build a special place. And we have that opportunity. And it's going to be up to people that walk through the door every day executing to make that happen. One of the things that you've done is you've changed the compensation structure here uh, over the past year. Yes. How much of an incentive has that been to get people over here? You know, it's one of those things. If you love incentive compensation, in other words, if you want to be rewarded for what you do or don't do, uh, this is a place for you. If that's not what you like, this is not the place for you. And very, very quickly, as a fund manager, uh, they start every year with a bonus target. So they know exactly the bonus they can earn. But to earn that bonus, they have to be in the top quartile over their peer group over a three-year period. If they happen to be a median manager versus their peer group, they're going to get half their bonus. If they drop to the 75th percentile, they get no bonus. So it becomes a very clear, understandable, and again, if you're a competitive person, the type of person we want to manage money at Putnam, that want to deliver for their clients, that want to sit on the same side of the table as they do, it's a great compensation structure. We know the Obama administration has been pretty vocal on regulating employee compensation. Are you worried about that, that that might change and impact your strategy? I, I don't. I, I think, again, uh, incentive compensation where you have uh, rewards over a long period of time, a three-year rolling average, uh, would be something very, very, very hard for anyone to argue against. I think part of the complaint of the Obama administration, which I agree with him on, is people were getting paid for short-term performance. In fact, I could see an environment where uh, CEOs of major corporations are paid on how the stock does over a three-year period. So you could tell whether what they put in place is just a winning a lottery for one year or it's really uh, making shareholder value or you know driving shareholder value. So uh, I, I think it's a great concept, so I'm not worried about it. Bob, you've been aggressively hiring senior folks from Fidelity. Those are the headlines anyways. But how is your hiring overall for rank-and-file folks? Uh, yeah, it, it hasn't been as aggressive. What, what we did, I think, is made a decision early on my tenure here is we're going to err on the side of the investment area. In other words, over hire there or really uh, build that up and distribution operations where we, we have we get great marks in the industry leave them pretty much alone 
In fact, if we have attrition, maybe let it go down. So we've been very, very aggressive, as you mentioned, on the investment side. And again, you mentioned Fidelity. We, we've hired from uh, Wellington, hedge funds, Wall Street, and it has just been Fidelity. Right. You mentioned uh, you're pretty active on the ground level with students, whether you're coming out of college or an MBA. How important is that for your strategy since you're rebuilding this firm? Going forward, I would love to grow from within as it relates to people. And what that means is have an aggressive college campus recruiting campaign every single year. So when you go to a campus, you're not just someone trying to hire uh, a graduate, you're part of the environment of the school. So you actually have professors working to recruit the best students to come to Putnam. And that's, that's what our goal is. We would love, you know, three years down the road, five years down the road, that any promotion, any new person taking over a fund is someone that has grown up in Putnam. What colleges do you have your tentacles in in terms of getting feedback from the professors, if any, right now? Well, I, I'd, I'd say it's uh, Dartmouth, Harvard, Amherst, uh, different schools, a lot, a lot in New England, but we want to spread that out a little bit. And uh, some of this is new programs, so we're really putting together the list now and getting started for next year. You talked about um, organic growth being a big strategy for Putnam, but there are good companies out there that perhaps have depressed values. Is there any acquisitions or do you see any value in doing perhaps any type of acquisition over the next six to 12 months to help you do your job better? I would never rule out an acquisition because I, I think that'd be foolish for any CEO to do. However, I would be hard pressed to think of one that really makes sense. And I think I would challenge anyone to point out to me acquisitions made in the asset management space that have really paid off. And, you know, my 30 plus years experience, I don't know if I've seen one. So uh, if we went into it, it would be very carefully. And one, we thought there was a tremendous amount of synergy that. You know, the minds were thinking alike on a lot of the parts of the business. I would see us, all things being equal, looking for what I call lift outs. If there is a large cap equity team or a small cap international team or something like that, they would come in and those are much easier to bring on board and get melted into your culture versus two companies coming together. Where are there some holes in Putnam now? that you would be looking to fill in terms of lifting out a team from someplace else? The holes, I think the work we still have in front of us is all our international funds are not where we want it to be. So we're looking at research there. Do we have the right people? Uh, Product-wise, do we have the right coverage? And then part of the small cap area. Uh, I think small cap research is a tricky animal, whereas in the large cap research, it's more doing a lot of analytics around a company balance sheet. In the small cap area, it's more a one-trick pony. And how's that one-trick pony going to perform under different conditions? So we want to make sure we have the right research coverage. Uh, I, I believe, and I, I'd say we believe, the fundamental research, being able to look at companies, tear them apart, understand their balance sheet is going to be key for investment success for the next five, ten years. You were quoted when you were, I believe, hired David Glancy. You said he's good at finding diamonds in the rough, such as what are some diamonds in the rough out there that, that you see now? It's actually the most opportune time for his fund after a market downturn because a lot of companies fall into his universe. So he looks at companies for the most part, that haven't done that well, but whose stocks starting to look good. And then he goes up the capital structure, which is why his fund is called the Capital Spectrum Fund. So he then looks at debt. Most of the time, it's a high-yield debt. Then he goes up to the bank loan. And whatever part is cheapest, again, he's going to like the stock. That's where he invests. So 
I, I would say he would tell you probably now is the most fertile market for the way he invests and he's seen in, in a decade. Before you joined Putnam, you almost didn't make it here. You almost ended up working for the NFL. You were one considered as commissioner. Did you know when um, that job opportunity came up that you'd be leaving Fidelity? Not really. You know, I think we all reached these points after, at the time I'd been at Fidelity 22 years, do I want to spend the rest of my career here? And I, I really couldn't answer it one way or the other, but when the NFL called, my first reaction was, I'm not interested because I really thought uh, there was a gentleman there who ended up getting the job, uh, Roger Goodell, who was probably the best candidate because he had been with the NFL 20-some years. And uh, after talking with a search firm who was Corn Ferry about that, why well, I was not interested, they uh, had done research, and uh, it was a majority of NFL owners thought they wanted to go outside of the NFL for the next commissioner. And uh, so I said, I'd like to take a look at it, and I immediately went to Ned Johnson, who's obviously CEO of uh, Fidelity, to talk to him about it, because in my lifetime, there, I only knew of two commissioners in the NFL. And I said, I didn't want to be sitting here five years from now saying, gosh, I wish I would have done that. I would rather have looked at it and said, yeah, that's not what I want to do and move on. So it was, uh, it was an interesting couple months, but it was fun. When we look at the NFL now, one of the trends that we've seen, you're a big sports fan, is a lot of teams have taken on a lot of debt to build a new stadium. If you were in that position now, I mean, would that be troublesome to you? if we look at what may happen over the next five or ten years? Not really. I, I think the economics of the NFL are the most solid of any professional league and th there are some stadiums that are self-funded but there are still a lot of stadiums that are public entities and I think would, which what works for the franchise. You mentioned you were at 22 years at Fidelity so that you spent really the bulk of your career there. How hard was it to leave there? It was it was very hard. When, when I joined Fidelity, it was like 22 billion under management, and when I left, we had 1.5 trillion. And I started the 401k business from scratch, and it was now 500 billion plus business. Most of Fidelity's uh, new flows. So, a lot of what had happened there, I'd had a part of. So that was difficult. And during that time period, you make unbelievable not just business associates but friends and I would say most of the senior management team were people that you know I had a hand in choosing so that all made it very very difficult but I think you just reach a point especially in this case it, it's a family run business which is fine I think the Johnson family have done a great job but I wanted a chance to do my own thing so to speak so and that wasn't an option there. Yeah. So when we look at uh, your future as you build this business, I mean, I would guess your phone must be ringing off the hook. Just we look around this area, there's a lot of financial companies. How mm -hmm. many calls do you get a day, people looking for a job? A lot. A lot more emails. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's interesting. It's, it's across the board. Um, Especially, I, I spoke a couple weeks ago and mentioned that we were going to do hedge funds. And we are at some point. And the amount of emails I got from firms saying, we'd like to be part of your solution has been astounding. So, uh, you know, there's unbelievable opportunities to do a lot of things in today's market. And that's choosing the right one and making the right decision. Right. I mean, and someone might say a hedge fund strategy now, again, the Obama administration is looking to regulate hedge funds in a big way. I mean, why would you want to get into that business if what makes it work is the non-regulation? Well, I don't know if non-regulation made it work. I mean, there's, there's a thought that was true. But we, we, having been in the mutual fund business for a long time, it's one of the most regulated industries very transparent, you know, all the, all the things we mentioned before. So I don't think the regulation of hedge funds is going to change. I think 
what you want to get in the hedge fund business for are to do other things you cannot necessarily do under the 40 act space like leverage, like shorting. I mean, you, you can short some, but not as much as you like. So it would provide you more investment flexibility. And, you know, again, I, I mentioned a lot of times you want to attract into an organization intellectual capital. I think the same thing on the hedge fund. Uh, get people thinking of different things, looking at different things, and the impact that could have on the whole organization makes it more vibrant, more you know, successful over time. Before you joined here, Putnam, not only did we have the financial meltdown that was well underway, but also Putnam had been suffering from a brand issue. Uh, was it hard to come in here and, and really rally the troops from a culture side? Were they ready for that? I, I think they were ready for it. They were tired of uh, getting beat up. I, I, I tell people that my first few days, it was a group of people playing not to lose. And it's tough to win when you're playing not to lose because you're not taking the risk, not reaching when you should be. They had not had a new product in four years, to, to give you an idea. So my, my first day was, hey, we're, we're here to win. This idea of not losing does nothing for me and mediocrity is nothing that I've ever want to be a part of. So it's, it's been all about winning, and uh, I think they were ready to go. My final question is, if I talk to you in a year, how is Putnam going to be different? We're going to be a lot better than we are today, and, uh, you know, we're going to continue to invest in the business. I think that's the key. Uh, we're going to continue to be innovative where we need to be, and I think you, um, you're going to see a continuation of the performance record that we've started because that's, that's the goals of the firm. And I, I do think we have the right people brought together to execute on that goal. After 12 months on the job, Reynolds says his strategy is starting to take shape. And regardless of what happens in the economy over the near term, Reynolds does believe that the heyday for the mutual fund business lies ahead. For the record, I'm Susanna Halloran.